Next up, we have Jake Reed, um, who's going to talk to us about Open Systems Assembly Protocol. Hi, Jake. Hey, everyone. Uh, hi, Nadia. Uh, let me just share my screen. You get screen one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there we are. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Jake Reed. I'm super excited to be here at OSHA in 2022. Um, I'm uh, right now a PhD student at um, the Center for Bits and Atoms uh, at MIT, which is actually where uh, Nadia came from also. She's one of our alums. Um, so today I wanna talk about uh, the Open Systems Assembly Protocol, which is something I've been working on for the last two or three years. Um, it came from machine design and machine control, uh, but in the future, I'm thinking it might be a cool way for us to generally sort of build a commons of modular uh, interoperable uh, open source hardware bits. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, back in 2013, I started working uh, in the sort of machine CNC machine space uh, as an intern at other lab, um, where I worked on this machine, the other mill, which has now become uh, part of Phantom Tools. Um, and I was an architecture student at the time, but uh, they hired me back on to do something I was totally unqualified for, which was uh, design this uh, metal laser cutting machine. Um, so I did this back in 2016, I think. Um, they're still available. It's a great machine. If you want something somewhere between a plasma cutter and a really high performance metal laser, um, they're out there. Um, and then <clears throat> now the CBA, I'm working on this thing. This is called Clank. Um, Clank is a fully FDM 3D printable uh, modular CNC machine. So uh, we have a bunch of fab labs all around the world and we have always wanted uh, to have sort of one common motion platform that we could put lots of different tools on. So when we install a fab lab, um, we you know normally bring five or 10 different machines, there's five or 10 different interfaces and there's five or 10 different processes and instead. And of course, everything's very expensive. Clank costs about $500. Um, and also, maybe more importantly, we thought this would be a cool way for uh, us to do sort of collaborative development of machine platforms. So <clears throat> if uh, we bring the motion system, someone else can design a tool, and then uh, we get to figure out how to put that stuff together. Um, and that's really what uh, or where OSAP sort of came from, the, the problem that generated this um, project, is that when you think about everything that's required to make a machine uh, work and produce a part, there's a huge amount of layers of software, all the way from really high power software like CAD and CAM, all the way down to a bunch of real-time firmware um, and different types of physics. This is sort of related to the uh, Fluigi CAD problem is that when you approach an open source problem, you often have, or an open source hardware problem, you often have to solve like entire stacks of, of, uh, of kit. And we want to do this in a distributed way. So we have this kind of problem, which is we need uh, specialization of engineering um, with, uh, you know, coordinated operation of different uh, components that people make, but we want to do it in an open way where there's no explicit coordinated development. So um, we think this is really important if we want to go from accessible fabrication to accessible automation. So not just looking at open source projects as uh, like standalone CNC machines, um, but things that are like uh, sort of pipelined workflows, um, things that look like factories that start to be made out of, you know, hundreds of different machines. Um, so actually, I'm sort of like the spiritual student descendant of Nadia. Um, and back in 2013, when I was an intern, she was uh, working on her PhD. And together with Elon Moyer, uh, <laughs> um, uh, she uh, wrote this piece of software called Gestalt, uh, which is a cool way to, uh, I would say, most importantly, introduce the idea of object-oriented hardware. Um, where you, uh, every time you want to add a new piece of function to your machine, you, you snap on another uh, module to the end of a bus. And then uh, there's a Python script uh, in the computer up there that sort of remotely operates all of the different modules. So the idea here was really important, object-oriented hardware, um, but it was sort of limited in that it centralized control into uh, one Python script. And so it was difficult to write, uh, especially low-level control loops. <clears throat> and then around the time I started at the CBA, Neil was, uh, who's my advisor, um, was having a sort of obsessive phase with uh, Dataflow uh, and JavaScript. And so he was writing this thing called Mods, 
which is a sort of workflow assembly tool, um, which lets you take you know, almost any input on, on one side and produce almost any output on the other side um, to do almost all of CAD, or sorry, of CAM, um, and then later also a little bit of CAD as well. And so <clears throat> when I started working on machine controllers, the idea was really to collapse sort of data flow into uh, embedded object-oriented hardware. Um, so this is Clank, uh, and yeah, it is on clank.tools if you want to build one. And um, uh, this is uh, just one of them. This is the sort of tall version. Right now, I use it as a printer most of the time. Um, and there's, a, there's an interface that runs in the laptop. There's a motion planner that coordinates uh, sort of look ahead for the global control. And then each little el other element is responsible for its own local control. So there's four Z motors, two Y motors, one X motor. The end effector is made up of four modules, which we'll talk about later. There's a bed heater, and then there's load cells. And then when we look at this um, as a network, uh, this is sort of the diagram um, of it. So we have seven motors, these three other things, a motion controller, and then there's a UI and a node.js script. Um, and the way OSAP works is you sort of take everything which is a, a memory bound computing context. So everything that looks and feels like a module is a context um, and it's responsible for its own little local environment. Um, and then we attach uh, networking links with these structures I call virtual ports and virtual buses, which are just nice little ways to wrap up whatever link layer you'd want uh, and include it in the network. So uh, as far as OSEP is concerned, the WebSocket and the serial port are the same thing. Um, and any bus is the same thing. So a CAN bus, an RS-45 bus, uh, wire, or, or Arduino's I2C library all look like the same thing. So we can use sort of um, whatever link layer we'd like. Um, and then to actually coordinate programs with this, uh, there are additionally software modules inside of these contexts. And then basically there's a routing scheme that lets us get from any software module to any other software module. Um, so if we want to jog the machine, for example, there's a button in the UI that we give it a route to a velocity controller um, later on in the motion controller. And we can route these things all the way down uh, into sort of things that are far away in the network. Um, <clears throat> so then this is the, uh, 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 oh my God, FBM printing head extruder. Um, it has an extruder motor and a heater module. And then there's two additional things. One is a filament sensor, which can measure, um, the width of the filament and the rate that the filament is traveling. Um, and then there's a load cell, which gives us sort of a pressure analog. Um, and so with this one, uh, we really need to coordinate uh, a low level controller. We want to uh, measure that actual filament rate and the thickness and then control for um, actual flow output. And so because we can sort of route things from anywhere to anywhere in the graph, um, we can pull uh, uh, our sensor data our sensored data um, into the flow controller um, and then have the flow controller do math uh, in, in an embedded context. Um, and put an output back down into the extruder motor. So we get to coordinate low level control loops um, without relying on any high level script, uh, like a Python script or a, Java, or a piece of JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, as I mentioned, these are these are contexts with software modules where we store the software modules in, in a sort of explicit tree like this. Um, and then the strange part is that we use an addressing scheme that's uh, path path addressing or, or source routing. So rather than trying to have uh, you know, unique identifiers for every resource in the network, um, instead we describe paths between resources and things are uh, addressed relative to one another. So it's sort of like telling your neighbor to go down the street and take a left rather than telling them to go to um, uh, uh, you know, 34 Madison Street or whatever. Um, and then some of the uh, uh, Software objects are these uh, network drivers. And so we add an additional packet instruction that tells uh, the packet to go over the network. Um, and these serialize into really lightweight packet headers. Um, and then because everything is just sort of, <clears throat> um, you know, step after step, it's really easy to write uh, very small firmware that operate this network. So we don't need complicated routers. So we can put this in sort of almost anything. Um, so, Programming these messy systems can be messy. Um, and so for this, I tried to take a stab at uh, making a sort of UI for this. Um, 
because they're graphs, we can render them as graphs, which is awesome. So we can actually do some programming without um, doing any programming. So there's no coding, but you're, you're writing programs. Um, and there's a discovery layer in here as well. So when I plug these two things in to my computer, um, they're being discovered by a sort of little network uh, traversal algorithm. Um, and then I can render them as they appear, and I can uh, pull routes from outputs to inputs uh, to connect, you know, one button, one button over here to um, to an LED somewhere else. Um, and then these also work as internal uh, sort of data flow programming languages. So that's uh, was just writing a new program that just lives on that uh, one device on the right. Um, and then. Uh, I can add a UART, so this is just a wrapper on the Arduino serial object to make a new um, data link there. And now I'm coordinating these two things um, without the second USB. Um, and I'm also doing this all live, so I can sort of hot plug everything and, and mess around with it. Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be cool if you could see where they are and actually project uh, the UI on top of them, but, um, but yeah. Um, and then this runs without the browser at all. Also, just so just to drive that home, this is going on really in the embedded uh, embedded system. So it's it's roughly embedded data flow everywhere. You know, up, up, down, you know up, 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 up. Um, so uh, I wanted to show a little bit of scaling. So this is a sort of messier system. Um, as I'm plugging things in, they're popping up, uh, and then I can how are we on time? Um, I can pull one one output to this button all the way on the left. I'm going to draw it out to all the other uh, LEDs in the rest of the system. And as I'm doing this, it's uh, you know finding paths through the network uh, in order to coordinate how to get things from one end to the other. Um, and I can make mistakes also. I accidentally plugged the wrong thing in over there. Um, and instead of having to go and look at my code, I could just look at the graph and say, oh, I've actually misconfigured this. Um, and then. Uh, also, uh, graphs are sort of automatically reclaimed. So I've unplugged it on the left. I've removed all the state from the browser. Now I'm plugging it in all the way on the right. Um, and it's going to draw the same graph, but sort of coming at it from a different angle. So it doesn't matter which device you start with. There's no inherent hierarchy. Uh, everything is like uh, everything is everything and, and sort of anything that you want it to be. Um, and then I thought uh, I would do one fun, tiny sort of uh, like interface code. So this is an IMU uh, device uh, from Adafruit. And I thought this was fun too, because at first I was like, oh, the X in the in the sensor is the, probably the X in my um, uh, uh, rendering engine, but it's not. Um, there's actually a little bit of orientation trouble here. But this is a way to configure this, is to just pipe the X into the Y uh, and you know mess around with it and, and see what's wrong. And you get a sort of immediate feedback when you're building the, the program. <laughs> Um, so how do you write this stuff? Basically, OSAP is a, a software API for a network interface. So you describe in software what your network interface is. I use these things called endpoints that have uh, callbacks when you get new data um, that you can write to. Um, and you can put routes on them. So if there's a route attached to an endpoint, whenever you write to it, it's going to try to publish that data on that route, um, probably to another endpoint. Um, you can make, uh, yeah, there's BNO, BNO 055. Um, you can make uh, uh, virtual ports uh, in Arduino just like this. I wrote these sort of helper classes. So if you have an Arduino sketch with a, with a serial port on it, you can just one line make a virtual port. I'm working on the wire one. Um, Multi-host uh, buses are tough. Um, and you can write whatever weird link you have uh, just by attaching a bunch of callbacks to it as well. Um, <clears throat> And then finally, hopefully I'll have time for questions. I think I will. I did want to also talk about why, why I'm really motivated behind this project recently and why I'm starting to try to make it public and, and get other people to hang out and work on it with me. Um, I recently read this really cool book called Working in Public, written by a woman named Nadia Eggball, uh, who worked at GitHub for a long time and studied open source software. Um, and the thing she comes away saying is that when we think about open source software, we normally think about um, sort of Linux and uh, LibreOffice and Apache, big standalone uh, projects. And she's saying, in reality, we need to think of open source as a sort of commons um, of functional modular units. So she's saying, let's look at NPM, which is Nodes Package Manager, uh, and PIP, 
which is uh, Python's package manager. And she's saying that the things that most people consume that are open source, source software are actually products that are made from modules that are open source. So when you use an app, uh, probably 90% of the code base is actually open source, um, but we don't normally see that. Open source users are sort of open source developers. Um, and so really critically, the way that we integrate our modular contributions together um, is super important to the success of an open source endeavor. So right now, I think the dominant sort of mode of, of commons production in open source hardware is that we have Arduino libraries, breakout boards, and then dev boards. Um, and none of those things are function on their own. They're components that we use to build function. And so we all end up doing this sort of um, <clears throat> You know, breadboarding exercise, which can be confusing because the elements we get from the different commons need to also work together. Um, and so we're sort of always recreating work doing this. And also none of this scales beyond one microcontroller. Um, yeah, Deadboard Industrial Complex was Zach uh, Frieden. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, and uh, yeah, so the proposal is that with, o with OSAP, you can basically take all the complexity of your little module and then wrap it up into your module, which has a firmware um, that people can look at, don't have to look at. Um, and then we put, you know, network interfaces on everything. Everything has a USB port basically already. Most things have serial ports as well. And then instead of integrating things with code, we integrate things with graphs um, and network applications. Um, so that's it. Hopefully we can answer some questions. Um, I, I don't want to do this thing, which is try to make a new standard. Um, uh, but I did want to sort of, uh, I guess, poke everyone and see uh, and see what the what the feeling was like about this. Um, so yeah, I just published uh, osap.tools, um, where uh, there's sort of more writing on this, and then there's a link to an example project that you can build. Um, and yeah, Clank Tools is also online. So um, that's the talk. Um, awesome. <laughs> Nadia is also on my generals committee, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we're going to make this straight into a very, very intense Q&A. Now, maybe, uh, there's, a, there's a ton of questions about details, like what, how does port forwarding work? Um, how do you imagine doing power, power especially for mobile devices? But maybe before yeah. we get into that, like uh, there's a lot of people at the Open Source Hardware Summit who build hardware. And yeah. what exactly is your ask? Um, you have this system and you have a standard. And so what is it that you want people to do next? Ideally, this is the perfect world right after this. Everyone is going to do what exactly? Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, try it out, see if it's useful for you. Uh, let me know if it's interesting or if it's just a total dud. Like, I, I don't really know. You know, we're isolated here in academia. I use it to build machines. It's been really useful for me. I don't really know what types of applications people want to build. In in my head, like uh, it's a way. So like uh, Adafruit and SparkFun have Quick and Stemma, which feel to me like sort of in the same direction, where they're saying, okay, let's get rid of this complexity of menu of like figuring out pinouts every time you want to do a project, and just build a world where people can can plug stuff in and and throw it into a sketch. Those two are still limited by sort of the one microcontroller boundary, and so. Um, you know, if you have two Arduino projects that you like have been trying to get to do stuff together and you haven't been able to do that successfully, see if you can use OSAP to get it to do something successfully. Um, I think everyone, there's sort of this fever dream of like everything's a module and wouldn't it be so cool? And this is, I'm not saying that I have the answer. There's so many questions like how you can do it. Um, yeah, like what are the standards? How, how complex does it have to be? Does it include power management or is that an application on top of it? Um, I don't really know. I'd, I'd love to hear like what people think about that. Um, yeah. Well, awesome. And, uh, sorry. No, I, I was just <laughs> going to start saying that you should answer everyone's. There's a lot of people who have questions on Discord. Um, totally. Yeah. And uh, and so everybody, uh, let Jake know what you want to build with modules all the way down. What if everything could just be done for you in a network rather than all of this configuration that we have to do every time we want to switch tool chains? It would be amazing. Um, yeah, so Jake, adding another point to the secretly Canadian vibe of this conference. Yeah, <laughs> secretly Canadian. I know I, I, showed, I showed it to my brother last night, and he was like, oh, Ontario Secondary School Assistance Program, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, 